this really is an extension of what Anna talked about. Um, research design and sample collection go hand in hand. Uh, you'll hear, hear later about some of the things that we can maybe do after the fact if things go wrong. Um, get it right. Um, so I'm talking today about more, it's, can you guys hear that feedback? Okay, how do I stop that? Is it echoing? Oh, okay. <laughs> I think so. Um, totally forget where I was. Okay, let's get started. Oops. Okay, so the objectives for this talk are to identify requirements for a given sample type. So we'll talk about some of the common ones, um, some general guidelines for how to process them and collect them. And then really, um, I want you to understand the importance of consistent sample collection. So you will hear the word consistent a lot throughout this. If nothing else, please take that home. Be consistent. Okay, so. There are many um, different factors that can affect the metabolome, and this is why design and sample collection are so important. So normally you want to, um, say, say, identify differences between a control population and a disease population. So you want to know what's happening in this disease. All of these different factors can change um, your metabolite expression, so you really want to um, try to, to dampen the effect that you get of the ones that you're not interested in. So say nutrition, drugs. So you try to um, take away anything that can cause changes in those between your different sample types. So looking at the workflow, the metabolomics workflow, sample collection really does fall under experimental design. It is something that you should think about ahead of time and, and do with your design. Um, so this talk will be from that perspective, the perspective that you have not already collected your sample. However, if you do have your samples, they're ready to go, you know, don't panic. Um, a lot can still normally be done with them. It's just better at that point to truly consult with us, really make sure before you, you know, spend all the money really delving in to, to make sure that it's still reasonable. Okay, so, so some common uh, sample types that we do see, and we will talk about in a little bit more detail, are cell culture. Um, various different biofluids, such as um, plasma or serum, urine, um, saliva, and then there are the others. We have dealt with a lot of these, but we will not talk in depth so much about them. If you work with something like CSF, um, lavage fluid, um, breath condensate, things like that, you know, it's, it's really important then to speak with us more individually so that we can tailor um, what you might need to do or things you might need to think about. And then tissues. Okay, so um, some common things that we'll talk about. So your sample collection is very dependent upon what you are collecting. There are uh, very, various things that are unique to different sample types and your final end objectives. So if you wanna do you know, lipid analysis versus looking at glycolytic metabolites. Um, however, one thing that is critical regardless of what you're doing is consistency is key. Make sure you are consistent throughout your sample collection. Uh, additionally, you wanna keep it cold as much as possible. You heard about this some from Anna, you'll hear about it more from me. Uh, and then consult with us, that is what we are here for. Um, we're always open to that, please don't hesitate to ask. Okay, so getting into cell culture, uh, you have suspension cells or adherent cells, right? So optimally, we say about a million cells at least. The main thing is that you want um, your groups to be equal. So if you have replicates or different conditions, say a treatment, try to keep the cell number the same. So um, Anna showed you a figure about, you know, thinking about growth phase. If you have different cell numbers, drastic different cell numbers across your conditions, your cells might be in a different growth phase at your time of collection. So you really want to make sure that you're keeping that consistent that you are, are trying to you know, decrease any variability among your sample as you go. Um, for sus suspension cells, 
Um, we do recommend that you wash your cells. Um, water is just fine. If you can't use water, there are various buffers. Some of them can have an effect on the mass spec. So um, if it's not something that's listed, um, you know, do, do ask before you do it. Uh, but you just want to spin them very slowly because you do not want to lice your cells. That should be, you know, a pretty common practice with cell culture. Um, but rinse them a couple of times and then really suck off the media, suck off the wash buffer. We want to dry pellet if possible and then quickly freeze it in liquid nitrogen as soon as you can after that final wash. Um, and then store it at minus 80 degrees until you either you know, ship it or if you're processing it yourself until you're ready to analyze your sample. Adherent cells you can actually um, do a little bit faster. So you just quickly do a rapid rinse. So you suck off your media, quickly put on your water, I mean less than 10 seconds, suck it right back off. And then you can just freeze your cells directly on your plate. There's no need to scrape them. There's no need to trypsinize. Um, just go ahead and put your liquid nitrogen right on there. Wait until it mostly evaporates. Um, you know, seal them up, storm at minus 80. Um, and that's, you should be good to go there. Okay, a couple of cautions with cell culture. It's important to stagger your start time. So say you're doing um, a treatment for about 10 minutes. You're, you're giving this you know, drug, inhibitor, whatever you wanna, wanna look at, and you put it on for 10 minutes, and you do your six samples, okay? You go to process those, even if you're just doing you know, adherent cells where you're sucking off the media really rapidly, you know, washing it, putting your liquid nitrogen on. By the time you get to your last one, you know, it might have been 20 minutes. Well, that's a huge difference, right, in your time. So make sure you allow for that in your timing. You know, just, just start them a little bit off. Um, your media type and nutrients. This is normally more important if you're doing a flexible mix study, but occasionally you'll have something in your media that can interfere with your end result. So this is where it is important to know what your objective is. Um, say you're interested in looking at glycolysis and you give labeled glucose. Well, if you had a, an abundance of unlabeled glucose in your media, you know, you need to know that. If you want to limit um, movement through like amino acid metabolism and you have amino acids in your, in your media, you know, that's still available to them. So even though you're not supplementing with them, they were there to begin with. So just, you know, take a look at what the base media is. Think if it's going to affect your um, main objective, your end point and go from there. And then additionally, we do recommend that you save your media for analysis. So certain things that you look at, like lactate, um, it can leak from the cell occasionally. So if your hypothesis is that lactate is gonna go up and you don't see that, and you're like, you know, why, 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 why did this not work? It may be that it did go up, it just leaked out of the cell, and we can then go back and analyze your media to let you know if that happened. So, you know, just store it in the freezer in case, in case you need it. Okay, getting into the biofluids. Um, we're gonna start with blood plasma serum, lump them kind of together there. Um, first thing is to determine the, t the time of collection. You heard about this from Anna some. Generally, we do recommend a fasting state. Um, once again, this is objective dependent, um, but you do need to, to determine that. It's best if, especially when, when working with patient population, you do take a detailed diet and medication history. Um, you know, as I showed at the beginning, metabolites come from a variety of factors. So you can get, you know, drug metabolites, age-dependent metabolites, um, nutrition metabolites. So, you know, if you have that information available to you, it may help you determine, you know, why you're maybe getting some of these differences in the end if it's not, you know, if there's a wide variability or something that could help you hone either your design, collection in the future, things like that. Um, additionally, have uniform collection tubes. So this goes back to consistency. Uh, as she said, we do prefer EDTA tubes. And then once you take your sample, um, it's best to just go ahead and aliquot it um, at like before you freeze it the first time. As she showed you before too, um, there are for specific metabolites, it's not you know, every single one, but freeze thaw effects can change the concentration of the metabolite present and it may impact your results. So it's best to just go ahead and aliquot it out. So that way, you know, if you want to analyze a sample, you know, send, send us a, sorry, a sample and then use another one for an ELISA or whatever. You know, you're not just taking that same one out, freeze thawing it multiple times, um, but you can just, you know, take what you want when you need it. Okay. Um, thinking about freezing them and storing them. So 
we, we do prefer that you just snap freeze them in liquid nitrogen. So it's immediate, it's quick, it's fast. Um, you know, this goes to the keep it cold. The colder you can keep it, the faster you can get it cold. Generally, the better off you are. Um, store at minus 80, transport on dry ice. So in this study here, um, they were looking at different um, storage conditions and shipping conditions. So for each metabolite shown here, um, there's zero hour. So what zero hour means is they took it out, immediately froze it, okay, and then analyzed it at a later time. They, they aliquoted uh, their sample before this. So they then left it at 24, for 24 hours at room temperature or kept it on a cold pack for three, six, or 24 hours. So this would simulate a four degree scenario or shipping it on an ice pack. What they found is that obviously keeping it at room temperature did change metabolite expression across a, a variety of metabolites. So it wasn't just one pathway, it wasn't just you know, lipids or amino acids or something like that. It, it changed widely dependent, you know, it seemed to be just a, a change in general, not necessarily metabolite specific. Um, and then even keeping it cold for a couple of hours up through 24 hours could have an effect on what they saw. Um, and this was in plasma, as well as in serum. So it wasn't you know, just plasma, it wasn't just serum, it wasn't just one type of metabolite. So from this we just say, you know, try to keep it cold as soon as possible, ship it on dry ice, preferably not on a cold pack. Um, Volume is something we always get asked. Um, once again, this is dependent on what you want. So if you want one assay, two assays, four assays, um, and what type of assay. The other thing I can say about that is that we are constantly working to improve our assays because like you, we know that sample is, is precious. We don't wanna waste it. So we're constantly revising our methods to try to use the least amount possible. Um, so if sample volume is absolutely critical to you, you know, do really ask absolutely what we need. If you aren't quite there, you know, we still may be able to use it. It just would then have to, you know, give us a sample, maybe not a precious sample, you know, do, do something, you know, take from a control or something, and we can try it and see what we can get. Um, okay, some cautions. Uh, you did hear these from Anna as well. Um, Avoid hemolysis, really limit your processing time, and if possible, process it on ice or in a cold room if, if, not, if ice is not available, but a cold room is, I don't know. Um, and then be consistent. Okay, switching over to urine. We prefer to have a 24-hour urine collection. Um, so, you know, this, this may not always be possible. Um, with animals, you, can, you should be able to get a 24-hour collection. Um, the reason for this is that in this study with rat samples, they looked at different time points, so different times of collection, as well as different collection um, conditions. So they looked at collecting for a 24-hour period and then analyzing that whole 24-hour material, collecting for four hours, and then um, the closed or the black circle boxes were collecting it on ice, whereas the opens were collecting at room temperature. And they found that the, you know, the they actually separated out more by if it was a full 24 hour collection and they were a lot tighter, right? So this is a principal component analysis where you're looking for a way to separate out your groups. Um, and it looks like, you know, having that full 24 hours, so going throughout the course of the day and any diurnal variations, anything like that, seem to be better. Uh, so we do recommend that. Um, and then, you know, when looking at the groups, the, the ones on, that were cold, so if you're doing a metabolic cage, put your tube in ice. Um, if you're taking from a um, patient population, you know, put it at least in, on ice in the refrigerator, you know, whatever, whatever that case may be, as soon as possible. Um, and with humans, it's best to do the first morning specimen and just collect via uh, clean catch. Okay, so for processing, we do recommend you put sodium azide in the tube. Um, nothing is worse than you take the time to collect all these samples, you go to get them out of the freezer, and you're like, oh, you know, crap, I can't use it, there's bacteria in it. Um, so do, do put that in there, it's not gonna mess up your metabolite expression. Um, keep them on ice, 
do measure the volume and then spin it to get out any precipitate or if you're doing a metabolic cage, any food contamination, things like that. Um, just leave a small amount above that pellet so that you really aren't you know, getting any of that junk up and then aliquot it out into your tubes, store it at minus 80. Some cautions. Um, so if you collect urine, metabolites from your meal uh, medication are going to show up in it. So part of the reason we say a morning urine, you know, maybe before that first meal, um, but you, you mostly will be able to see those things. Do put sodium azide in there, as we said, and store it at minus 80. Uh, so what you're seeing here is another, another principal component where they're just testing out um, different sample conditions on urine storage. So what they did was they took um, 40 patients, collected urine, they either um, immediately froze that urine or kept it at four degrees for 24 hours, okay? And they analyzed them in triplicate. So a good thing is that, um, so this is patient eight, they just numbered them, you know, one through 40. Uh, they separated out by patient regardless of storage condition, okay? But, um, I'm sorry, the, the blue is uh, tw uh, four degree, whereas the red was, was freezing it, excuse me, right away. Um, they had a, you know, a little bit tighter, they found a little bit, a little bit better if you froze it right away. Um, but, it, you know, say you're, you're getting a human sample and you're letting them take it, you know, at home the first morning and then they're bringing it back to the lab at some point. You know, it wasn't drastic. Um, so, you know, urine seems to be a little bit more lenient, I would say, than plasma, something like that nature. Um, but do try to get it cold as soon as possible. Okay, saliva. We won't go into depth on this. Um, but basically, if you are going to take saliva samples, do it in a non-stimulated fashion. Do not give them anything, you know, to promote salivation, you know, not chewing gum, not mouthwash, whatever. Just have them do like a quick rinse um, with water, wait a couple minutes, and then, you know, start, start collecting your sample. And then, um, you know, uh, along, along the common themes, keep it cold. Try to get it cold as soon as possible. Um, dietary restrictions are not necessary for collecting saliva. You're not, you know, you really don't see too much of an effect there. However, it's still best to keep a record um, if possible. Okay, tissues. Um, solid tissues, the amount really does vary depending on what tissue type you have and what you want to look at. So metabolites are present in different quantities. Um, it, it really can impact your study. You know, we generally request a certain amount. If it's a problem for you, you know, talk to us and let us know and we'll work with you on that. Um, I think consistent sampling time and method is absolutely critical when you're talking about tissues. Um, it is for all sample types, um, but tissues are, you really need to be consistent. Um, we do recommend a consultation just to help you get the most out of what you, you know, you spend. Um, and then definitely freeze it as soon as possible. So metabolism is continually happening. You know, you really want to stop that as soon as you can. Okay, cautions. Um, be consistent, nothing else, be consistent. Um, so as we talked about, metabolism varies, you know, due to so many different reasons that you really want to minimize the outside impact of things that you're not interested in. Okay, so if you're going to fast, make sure you fast for the same amount of time. Anna touched on this, right? If you do, you know, an animal, say a four-hour fast, keep it at four hours. In humans, if you do an eight-hour fast, keep it at eight hours. Um, collecting at the same time of the day. It's, it's so critical for all of your samples that you do this. Uh, you'll hear more about anesthesia versus euthanasia in different anesthetics uh, later in this, this series. I think it might be tomorrow or this afternoon. I don't know. Um, but that matters. It really matters. Uh, for animal studies, we do recommend that you perfuse with PBS so that you clear out the blood. That way um, you won't get any interaction there. It, you know, it matters more for, for certain uh, analytes, metabolites than others. But as a general rule, we do recommend you um, do uh, use a PBS perfusion. 
If your tissues need dissected, please do it before sending them. Um, you know, if you want to look at the aorta and you send us the heart, you know, we'd prefer if you just give us the part you want to analyze. Um, additionally, we've also gotten, you know, if you take one animal and you're interested in three tissues, please separate those tissues out by, by type. You know, don't put all three in the same tube. Yes, we're, we're pretty competent and we can normally tell the difference, but, um, you know, it makes me a little nervous sometimes. So please, please do separate them out. Okay, so a few general tips. Label your tubes directly with permanent marker. Um, nothing, you know, when you use liquid nitrogen, if you don't use it that often, the labels do tend to come off. So nothing is worse than opening up that, you know, doer or your box or whatever it is and seeing all your labels down here and all your tubes down here. And it's just, you know, you're done, right? Um, you can't tell what anything is and that's really unfortunate. Um, document, document, document. Um, there are a variety of different things you should keep track of. So sampling site, this means two different things. So if you have, say, a multi-center study, know what center it was collected at, obviously. Um, also, you should know exactly where you took that sample from. So if you're taking plasma from an animal, did you take it from the tail vein? Did you take it from the heart at sacrifice? Um, you, you need a record of all of this. Um, you know, don't just say, oh, we took blood. Um, you should know where you took it from because changing that, you'll see in a minute, can have a large effect on your metabolite expression. Um, and then obviously know what time, you know, the sample was taken and stored. So say, you know, in the case of urine, if you're having someone collect their own sample, you know, provide them with a sheet where they write down, this is the time I took it. Not just tell them, but have them, you know, write it down. This is the time it went into the refrigerator or the freezer. And, you know, did you eat or anything? Did you take any kind of medication? You know, anything like that. Just be really explicit um, in what they need to keep track of. Um, this next point to me is incredibly important and something that we don't always do enough of. Develop a very detailed sampling protocol. Um, it says here, you know, if multiple people are obtaining samples, I would say that this is true regardless. Um, obviously, you can probably see this if you have a multi-center. You know, you, consistency is so important. And so the more people involved, the more, um, room for little variabilities, right? You know, maybe they don't recognize, oh, when you say morning, you mean, you know, 8 a.m. versus 9 a.m. or, you know, things like that. Be as explicit as possible um, in, you know, what site to take it from, like which vein. Um, if you're gonna use a specific tube, make sure they know what tube, if it's urine, that they have sodium azide in it. Um, even in the lab, like with an animal study, you know, maybe you have a grad student or a postdoc that does these studies and, you know, they take the sample while they go on vacation and they just hand somebody or they tell somebody, you know, oh, just take blood. You know, they, they might do it in a different manner. So the more detailed you can be or spinning conditions, you know, you don't want to lice things. Um, the more detailed you can be, the better off you are. It's better to have the information and not need it than for it not to be there and someone to wing it, right? Um, so really try to make a detailed sampling protocol. The other reason for this is you do your pilot grant, you get great results, so promising, but you know, it's been a couple of months, you go back to do the real thing and you might forget a few steps and then, you know, it, it could have a big impact on your readout. So really keep track of what you do. The other thing then, if something does go wrong, you can really finally look at what you did and figure out if maybe there was a step in there that could be revised to get you better results. Um, consider your groups during collection. Uh, what I mean by this is that if you have, this varies depending on how many conditions you have, but say you just have a control group and a disease group. Um, don't always just process all of your controls followed by all of your disease. Try to randomize it or intermix them uh, because timing is so important and we're gonna illustrate that in a minute. Um, but it's best if you can mix it up and not just, you know, do one group followed solely by the other group. Um, 
And then obviously consistency. And again, consistency. Uh, so consistently be consistent. I'm just going to keep saying it. You'll get it, right? Um, small changes do have very large effects. So, you know, Anna talked a little bit about changes in diet. Well, diet, nutrition, cause changes in metabolites. So, you know, you want to try to, if you're not concerned with nutrition, or, or that's not your objective, that's not your endpoint, you know, you want to try to dampen those effects so that you can see your points of interest. Um, changes in sampling sites. So this is what I was talking about. This was um, an animal study. This was in rats. From the same rat, they took a blood sample from the, both the abdominal aorta and the jugular vein. Same time, I mean, obviously not the exact same time, but like, you know, minutes apart. Um, and when they analyzed it, they did not separate out by animal, they separated out by sample site. So this is another PCA where you're looking for separation between your samples, right? And um, they could tell which samples were taken from the abdominal aorta versus which ones were taken from the jugular. So my point with this is, you know, it goes back to the consistency feature. Um, it does matter where you collect your sample from. So um, if you have different people or just, you you know, it's easier one time, I'm not saying it's not okay to take that sample because this, this is separated out based on mainly one or two metabolites. But, you know, if you do take it, say you can't get access to a particular vein that you normally use, and so you take it a different way, just document that so that if something does come back and it looks like an outlier, you have a reason to believe it actually may be. Okay. Um, I wanted to talk about this study a little bit, um, and this is in regards to sampling time. So in this study published uh, last year in Cell Metabolism, they were concerned with determining what lipids are under circadian control. So they just did uh, shotgun lipidomics, so they're detecting as many lipids as they can. So here they detected um, in, inaccurately identified uh, a little over 150 lipids. And they found that of these, so they plotted them out. They, they took liver tissue from mice, and they collected um, basically on every two-hour time point. And then they said, okay, we're going to detect all these levels by lipid and see which ones change. So if it's like, you know, average levels, baseline levels are consistent throughout the day versus ones that fluctuate. They have a peak, right? Um, a definitive peak at one you know, area throughout the day. And they found that 17% of the lipids that they could identify, accurately identify, did, did seem to be under circadian control so that they had a peak expression time. Okay, when they broke this down, so this is the 17%, okay? So 17% by uh, type, they found that the majority of them were triacylglycerols, followed then by uh, phosphatidylcholine. So over half, of all of the lipids under circadian control were these two groups. Um, so you might think, okay, that's great, but you know, how, how does that represent like the total number, right? Um, so they looked at it that way, and this is um, what percent of each class are, are under circadian control versus the amount they detected. Okay, so almost half of the phosphatidyl inositols up here, BI, um, were under circadian control, and then about a quarter of the triacylglycerols and phosphatidylcholines were under circadian control. Um, they then took these lipids under circadian control and, and just plotted them. So each dot represents one lipid that was under circadian control. And this is their clock. So the zero hour time point is lights on, so generally around 6 a.m. The 12 hour time point would be lights off. Um, and then each dot is colored, and that corresponds to a specific lipid class, okay? Um, so what they found is that there were peak times of distribution uh, for certain lipids, and sometimes a class, like the, the triacylglycerols, kind of seemed to be on the same, you know, the same um, time frame, the same circadian control, but it wasn't always true, right? And they found that when doing this in multiple strains of mice, it did not seem to be um, strain specific, but it was dependent on feeding time and it was dependent on the truly the lights on. So if they changed the time the light came on, it changed the circadian control of these, these lipids. So let's, let's say that 
you have a study and you have um, control animals and diabetic animals and you want to test the effect of um, a lipid lowering drug on triglyceride um, accumulation in these two conditions, obviously, a reason given this, that we picked this example. But you have a grad student, they're probably not coming in at 6 a.m. You know, maybe they'll get there at 8. Um, so that's 2 p.m. or 2, I'm sorry, 2 on your clock. Okay, they treat with this drug for six hours. So what they're interested in are the triacylglycerols. They're collecting your sample for you. It's really easy to say, okay, there are four mice in my cage, so I'm gonna take this control cage, collect sample from these four mice, and then I'm gonna take my second control cage, collect samples from those four mice. Then I'm gonna take my disease animals, my diabetic animals, collect their samples, take the second diabetic animals, collect their samples. If you know that these are under circadian control and this is their peak time, you're collecting your control samples here and you're not collecting your disease samples until here. You know, I think you can clearly see that you're already giving a difference to your results, right? Um, this is why we say, you know, be consistent. It's not that you can't collect all those samples on the same day, that's, that's fine. But do mix up your groups. You know, don't just say, I'm gonna take all of my controls followed by all of my disease. Um, really try to, you know, make sure you get both of them in there so you're getting rid of that variability. Ultimately, in consistency, that's what we're doing, right? We're trying to take away the variability and minimize that, okay? Um, a little early, sorry. So these are the references I used. On the bottom here, you'll see um, this uh, address. This is where you can go to find um, we have a sample protocol sheet typed up that has some, a lot of the general guidelines that we talked about even in more detail. Um, and it should also be in your box folder. But if you wanna go back and reference that specifically, it's, there's the, the site for you. Okay, are there any questions? So that certain example you mentioned that the washing with water, or can we use PBS? I'm just worried that of course, of course. So we, we recognize that not everybody wants to use water or can use water. You can use PBS. We had, um, I think it's a little bit of ammonium acetate. That would be preferential. Um, but PBS is, is possible too. You know, once again. So, so the phosphate group can actually dampen your signal a little bit in the mass spec. Um, it's, you know, we, we use PBS in the animals, we perfuse with it. You know, it's, it's not, um, I wouldn't say it's horrible, <laughs> um, but it's just a, a preferential line of the least effect, you know, it, it's gonna be a small effect. So if PBS is, is what you need to use, we can, we can definitely work with that. But still water is bad. And so yeah. washing with water immediately freeze the samples? Or? Yeah, after you get, if you have, do you have suspension or adherent? adherent cells. Yeah, wash really, really fast. I mean, when you're talking like, you know, as soon as you put it on, take it back off. You know, do one at a time. Don't put water on, you know, five of them. Suck it off. Just put it on, take it off, freeze it. Okay. The, plate. Uh, the plate, yeah. yeah. And then we can bring in the plate. Yep. You can just put that plate then on the dry ice, you know, wrap it up. So you're, you know, you keep so the lid on. We, so in the, uh, in, on the website, um, but also if you, uh, I think we put the paper, Lorenz's paper, if we didn't, we'll, we'll put it in the Dropbox. But, so Matt Lorenz in the, and uh, when, as a graduate student went through a number of different ways of washing adherent cells to get the best recovery. And either warm water wash or, or, or ammonium acetate actually looks like it does. You just do it very quickly. You're not gonna lyse cells in, in seconds. You know, but as, as Kelly indicated, you know, the phosphate can do some suppression of the signals, and then the salt sort of junks up columns and things like that. And so it's, it's better to do a, a quick wash um, in, in, in water or ammonium. The ammonium acetate will volatilize off when you try the samples. So, um, but we, we'll, we'll drop that paper in there, why, why it's done like that. What other calorie density can you use during the sample preparation? I'm sorry, could you say that again? I mean, for a 
particular metabolite actually cleave the same metabolite to determine how it affects. And do you have any idea what we can do to large for metabolite, like metabolome targeting? Um, I'm not sure. So I, I think I understand. I so, uh, so if you're looking for a specific metabolite, if you can get a, a C13 labeled or a deuterated um, uh, 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 molecule, that can be added to the extraction uh, 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 fluid to uh, look at the recovery. So in general, and, and Chun Hai can actually uh, um, can uh, tell, but what, uh, I think we, we have internal standards. If you're doing uh, recovery just for TCA cyclic we do put internal standards in, in there for recovery, correct? Um, you know, when you do fluxomics, it's a little bit more difficult because you have labeled compound in there um, as well. Um, so, you know, there's various methods for looking at recovery of, of certain classes of compounds that you can use by using labeled standards. We sometimes use the extracellular matrix to plot the plate, let's say collagen. So then if we want to see that how that would affect the metabolism of the cell, can we do that? Let's say I can bring in the collagen at one plate. For mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, obviously, at that point, it is still best to consult. It, you know, when you have specific individual questions, you know, before you would, preferably before you run the sample. But like I said, even if you already have them collected, you know, it's it's not, you know, even if maybe it wasn't everything, you know, we talked about it doesn't mean it's bad. Just you know, we might need to think a little bit more ahead of time, especially with money. Um, but in that situation, yeah, I mean, collagen is common. Uh, a common plate coat, you know, something you coat your plates with. Um, I believe we've done that before, use, use plates coated with collagen. Um, I know we use them. Um, so it, um, it really shouldn't, and like you said, it, you know, it may be just that we want to analyze a plate first that was just coated with collagen to see how much background there is, especially if you know what type of metabolite you're interested in. Then we can specifically say, okay, you know, we don't see an effect there, or it's so minimal that, you know, you're, you're going to be fine. But before you do the whole scale study or waste all your, you know, your funds, um, we, we can definitely do that for you. Yeah. I think there was a mention about uh, lyophilization of your samples. How do you account for the inherent loss of, or potential inherent loss of metabolites during the the process of a lyophilization and warming your sample? That's a great question. So um, as, as Chuck alluded to, we, we do almost all the time, <laughs> other than flexomics where you're, you're more limited, um, we do always add internal standards. We try our best to put the actual labeled um, metabolite um, for what we're looking for. Occasionally that's not available. Um, and so we use a surrogate or something very closely related, uh, mainly structurally in the same pathway. Um, and we add those prior to any of that. Like in our extraction step, we add them for extraction. And we know exactly how much we added. And so that's what we use, um, sorry, for our quantification in that, in, in knowing that. So um, we've also tested our assays. So in the assays that we run, some are better being lyophilized, some are better drying under nitrogen, um, some it's fine to use heat, some it's not fine to use heat. Those are things that we, we try to optimize because we do want to minimize any sample loss. We want to keep things as intact. Um, and so we, you know, we, I don't think we talk too much about that because we're working with that we're running your sample. Um, if you're going to run your own sample and you need more information about that, you know, contact us and we can talk to you more in depth about it. But we do base it a lot on these, these known standards that are pure labeled so we can directly compare. Yeah. So in another context then, do you use uh, like a labeled cocktail, essentially an untargeted metabolomics for, uh, I guess, to assess matrix effects and so forth? We do. And, um, You know, I'm biased. Um, so I'm, I'm presenting a paper on Wednesday. Now you hear about uh, an untargeted lipidomics where they used one lipid standard as their, their internal control, one labeled, or well, 17-0. Um, 
I personally like our method, um, because we try to we try to be broader. Um, so that way, for untargeted, you know, we're not just relying on one thing, but we're doing it more on a class basis, um, not just for lipids, but untargeted, you know, um, glycolysis, DCA, you know, anything, anything in those in those areas. We do use a cocktail um, where we cover a, ver a variety of different steps. Um, the, you know, we know in our untargeted platforms what we normally see, the different, you know, the sugar phosphates, the, you know, TCA cycle metabolites, maybe the amino acids, and we try to include at least, at a minimum, one of each of that pathway. Um, a lot of times, frequently more, but at a minimum one. Yeah, sure. Um, if you're working on a longitudinal study, and um, you collected samples from many years ago, but they're at different time periods. Is there a way to standardize after you collected the samples if certain metabolites fluctuate by the circadian rhythm, or are you? No, you, you can. I, in this case, I would say consult, and this is where you need your statistician friend to help you out. Um, and then it, it really, it, you know, I think you're, I'm, I'm not the best person to ask the statistician is here, um, but in, uh, is he here yet? Is George here yet? I don't think so. Um, he. So oh, if you're collecting samples over, a, a, like if you have samples collected from previous years and they're collected at different time periods, um, different times of the day, is there a way to standardize if metabolites are fluctuated by the circadian rhythm? So, I, I mean, you could look and see if the collection time is an independent variable to uh, um, as as far as influencing the difference in the metabolite levels. So that's you know just one of the the co-founding factors. If you have an idea that they they vary, now can you correct for that? Um, you you can if you have enough samples. And the other thing I think is that if you don't know, you know it may be you know you may know but you may not know. You know and you can always test that. Not in those direct samples, but but you could do a little study because not everything obviously is under circadian control. But but there are ways that you can maybe maybe also see the importance of if that is going to be a factor. Um, but you know, there your documentation is important too. So yeah. Uh, extending that question, uh, sometimes I have no idea whether the subject was uh, fasting or not because we did not collect that information a while ago. And second, uh, if you have a longitudinal study that uh, goes back 20 years, and, and living in New York, not entirely sure the freezing and that the power went out sometime in between, and, and uh, uh, whether Wait. there was a um. freeze of thaw <laughs> that is completely unknown to me. Of course. Uh, is there, what do you do? Okay, so the first question is, um, you don't know that they're fasting or non fasting. So we say too fast. Obviously, it's metabolite dependent. Um, there are metabolites that, you know, literature does not find much of a difference between with fasting, non fasting, and then there are that do. So glycolysis. Glycolysis is going to be impacted by fasting, non fasting. Um, you know, if you, if you consult with us and tell us your specifics, we can also help guide you towards what would be a good idea of, you know, maybe things to look at and what, you know, we're not telling you you can't look at, but, you know, your data is going to be murky at best, I would say. Um, you know, I, I think the best thing there is to really think, you, I think you just have to think more about your objectives in a situation like that and consult more um, and, you know, be, be open about you know, the flaws maybe in, in the design and, and that you just don't know. It's not that it's a flaw per se, you just don't know. So um, we can really then help guide you and it may be that we do, you know, we test a couple and see what we get as far as degradation goes. So if you don't know maybe how they were stored exactly or you don't know if the freezer went out, you know, 15 years ago on the weekend and nobody found it until Monday. Um, good thing about that, as long as nobody opened it, you know, it's still pretty good. Um, we, in that situation, I would say, you know, we can always look at one sample. Um, you know, we, when, you, when you do this enough, you get a pretty good idea of how a sample is supposed to look, right? Especially if it's a matrix, like plasma, um, a tissue type that you use a lot, you know. Um, 
if you're taking like something completely crazy, you know, like the, the Drosophila. If maybe we hadn't worked with like Drosophila lymph before or something, you know, it might seem a little odd to begin with. But as long as, you know, it's something that we've definitely seen, we, we do relatively know, and we could just run, you know, whether it's an untargeted or something, just to see if it looks clean. Um, you know, that's, that's definitely something we can do. Um, if, if it's something like a freezer, uh, you know, I think it's more likely to be okay if, if you think they were thawed or if they were stored at minus 20 for years and not at minus 80, then that can have more of an impact, actually. Um, How much of it? Uh, I think that's very dependent on, on sample type um, and what you want to analyze. Um, certain metabolites are more stable than others. I mean, we know that from our analyses. There are things that you need to extract and run immediately, and things that, you know, you want to measure multiple things in the same sample. We line it up, you know, those assays so that we measure, you know, the, um, the, the ones that degrade faster first, and then the more stable compounds last, right? Um, I, I think you know, we'd have to talk more about what you're, what you're using and how long it was, was stored that way. Um, we have seen degradation at minus 20 in certain sample types, um, you know, and that's unfortunate. Um, no. Okay. Any other questions? Oh, yeah. how, many, how many hours of starving do you think enough? Uh, that, do you see... How many hours do you need, need to see? Uh, how many hours do you need for, to see the clearance of that effect of diet, or any good biological marker of fasting? Right. Yes. Um, so, uh, and I'm not sure exactly what you're asking, but let me let me just give you a, a few uh, quick things. <laughs> One, diet will not be erased by fasting. Okay, I'll show you. I'll show you some data, you know, from uh, both animal studies and from uh, um, uh, from human studies that that the effect of diet on specific parts of metabolome are, are, are especially the lipidome, are, it, it, it's it's um, it's it's persistent over days. It changes very quickly as well. So um, the, in mice, if you uh, they go into a gluconeogenic mode and their amino acids will start to rise after about three hours of fasting. Um, so remember, their metabolism is about 15 times higher than humans. You know, humans will go into glucon uh, gluconeogenic mode after about you know four, six, eight hours of fasting, and so you'll 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 normalize that. Uh, you know, the the beta hydroxybutyrate is a, a great marker of uh, of um, of fasting state. Uh, I can put a slide up that that shows that we we have some data from uh, from rats fasted or fed. Um, there's there's a lot of other things that you have to think about. You know, actually having a mouse um, singly caged versus doubly uh, caged in groups actually changes their metabolome. Um, you know, the temperature of the mouse. Uh, you know, there's a, lots of things that you have to think about when you actually do these things. Now, these are subtle changes, but if you do enough of them, you can actually start seeing changes. So, um, um, so you asked about t fasting and and and, uh, and yeah, especially for human samples. Right. So how many hours do you recommend for so, fasting? So you know it's the same thing as just about anything. Is is it, you know an overnight fast? You know eight hours. You know is 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 pretty good. Um, you know, but you'll 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 persist with the changes in your metabolome depending upon your dietary status and your insulin resistance status, and and you know, uh, we've, uh, we've we actually know that if you walk around a little bit, your metabolome changes. I mean, so you know, the consistency of things that you do is really critically important. Um, and so, but it's not like you, you, you shouldn't do an experiment with humans because, you know, all, everything can change things. You know, there are still a lot of things. You just need bigger numbers because humans are variable anyways. Um, so, um, you know, it's just, I think consistency is, as best you can is really critically important. So just follow up. So overall metabolism, metabolomics does not change by just the type of the dinner you had. Or let's say pizza versus sushi, or does it change the metabolomics in the next morning? Or? So, um, so we have data two days of changing diet. You can see see things. We've we've done. I mean, um, I can I, I should put up more curves. Uh, I, I'll change my talk for tomorrow afternoon. Um, the uh, you know uh, how 
So we've done like mixed meal tolerance tests over time. And after about three hours, most things, uh, at least the things that we've been measuring, have been have come back down to their baseline levels. But um, but if you um, if you do a mixed meal tolerance test, um, it actually things go opposite. Um, uh, Charles had done some stuff in rats. I don't know if Charles is here. Um, uh, that if you do a mixed meal tolerance test in a rat, it takes you know it takes an hour or so for things to come back to sort of their baseline, just because of the faster metabolism rate that they have. So. Um, if you do a glucose tolerance test, you know, your glucose will go up, but all your, most of your metabolites actually drop um, during a, a glucose tolerance test, um, simply because you, you release a lot of insulin and then, you know, uh, uh, mobilization of amino acids from skeletal muscle during the fasting state is shut off right away. And so if you start thinking about how you, you know, the, the temporal relationship between you and you eat and specific metabolites and what you eat and things like that, it clearly is going to change it. We did an experiment uh, with Orman and I. We actually, you know, went out and had a big breakfast up at the, you know, North End Grill and, and you know, an hour later our metabolomes were completely different um, than what you what we had. We could still separate him from me. He was different than I was, but um, uh, thanks. Um, we did a study, this goes back to a study with uh, um, a colleague looking at um, a, a study to predict who, which uh, adolescents were going to get uh, diabetes or, or glucose intolerance. And they had samples from both a non-fasting sample and fasting samples. And actually, the non-fasting samples differentiated the groups better, even though they were variable between the, uh, the, the, um, the, the time before they ate. And probably when you're insulin resistance or getting near insulin resistance and you're re affected by something, you're going to have a greater effect when you challenge the system. So if you start thinking about these kinds of things, there may be better times to sample if you have a limited, numbers of, 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 uh, a limited number of samples that you want to run or you can collect. You might think of doing something in a different state. Um, and so um, it depends on exactly what you want to measure and what you're looking for. If you're looking for a biomarker of pancreatic cancer, you know, you probably want everybody pretty much in the same state. But then you start thinking about, well, if the cancer is going to secrete something, if you give it more nutrients, maybe I want to do it that way. You know, it, it's a young science still. Uh, yeah, no, we, ha we have a lot of human liver samples in our lab. Um, we are interested in doing some metabolomics using these samples. Um, the samples are from different resources, you know, from different hospitals, different uh, uh, universities. So we don't know what exactly the protocol they used um, during sample collection. So we are concerned about, you know, overall sample quality. Um, so is, is any way, I mean, can you use metabolome profiles or use some specific metabolites to determine if um, the, the, or the sample uh, integrity of um, before you do your proteomic study? Oh, um, right, and this, you know, they're, they're kind of similar questions there. Um, so, you know, we talked about that this is I ideal conditions, right, is, is knowing ahead of time how to do these things. But frequently that's not the case, right? Um, many times you inherit samples or you join a project and, and you don't know because things are ever, you know, we're forever changing, we're forever evolving. Studies that started forever ago, you know, we know a lot more now about the importance of these features. So that's okay. Um, normally one, you need a larger sample size if you're not sure because you need to take out those changes. As far as a marker to talk about sample integrity, um, I would have to think more about that, and I think uh, that would also be type specific. Um, you know, if you have you know, plasma, urine, tissue, um, you know, like I said before, we can run, you know, a sample, a couple of samples, and see if there's a lot of degradation in it. But if you want like a specific marker in each sample, um, I, I would have to think about that one. Um, I, I think, again, it comes back to what's the question you're trying to ask? What yeah. metabolites are you going to, uh, are you need to look for? If you want to just do a broad survey of a lot of metabolites, um, depends on what your phenotypic endpoint that you're going to compare to. Uh, you know, it's, 
it's you know we uh, we've done some work and there's published work about uh, you know which what kind of metabolites degrade with time um, um, uh, uh, you know sitting at room temperature or, or however and so um, you know th there's references in there but yeah, you know, I'll show you. I'll show some data in a little bit about you know sample collection and or you know what goes bad just in the minus eighty over you know a you know forty year period. Um, you know, there's some stuff that changes no matter you know how cold you keep it, um, but there's most of the stuff is actually pretty good. Okay, and I apologize, but I think we're out of time for this one. So Chuck is actually going to come up now and talk to you again.